Today, uh, Rob Paul is going to talk about some uh, privacy issues in statistical learning. Rob. Thanks, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming. I'm going to talk about differential privacy and reproducing the global space, which is something I've been working on recently with. So I've been working on recently with Larry Wasserman and Alessandro Ronaldo out of the stats department. Uh, so I, I put in the abstract, I don't really assume that anyone knows about privacy or reproducing the whole space or anything. But I realized as I was coming in here that I kind of did assume people know med, like hardcore magic theory. So it is okay that once I get to that part, I'll uh, you know, hopefully we can smooth things out and it won't be too bad. But anyway, uh, the overview will be like this. I'll start off with some kind of background stuff, which is other people's work mostly, and kind of like a review and an introduction to you guys if you don't know about privacy. Talk about why it's important to care about privacy, uh, and then a particular uh, criteria that's arisen in the last decade or so called differential privacy, which has gained a lot of popularity in, in statistics, uh, and then describe some methods which attain the differential privacy um, in finite dimensional spaces. And this will be all kind of other people's stuff, will be the introduction. Uh, then uh, the thing I've been working on is how to extend this idea to function spaces. And so that will comprise the bulk of this talk, hopefully. And then we'll end with some examples which should be interesting because they are very machine learning esque, I guess. All right, so I start, I've got this little caricature of what can go wrong in, in data release studio. So suppose we have an agency, I depict it as like a hospital here, or as a giant database uh, comprising of information about a set of individuals, right? Uh, yeah. So in this case, a uh, hospital has a, a giant database of all their patients with measurements like their age and weight and so forth. Now, at some point, uh, they may wish to release some statistics of this data set, uh, for example, so that researchers can write a paper about it or, you know, see if the medication's working or whatnot. So here I give an example, pizza hat, uh, subscript D, which I just used. Uh, the example I gave is just a simple ordinary least squares linear regression estimator. That's an example of a kind of, uh, uh, kind of statistic that may be of interest to researchers. Uh, and then what can go wrong is once this is released into the world, some kind of uh, bad guy with access to some, you know, whatever information is available to him off the internet may be able to, to use this uh, like least squares estimator and figure out things like uh, the presence of certain individuals in the data. Or if he knew some individuals already in the data, he may be able to figure out characteristics of something like that, weight or whether they have high disease or whatnot. So this can lead to embarrassment to the original agency at the very least, or in some cases, uh, like lawsuits, things like this. So the goal of, of so-called privacy-preserving data mining research is basically to, uh, to prevent identification of the individuals in the data set, but while maintaining some kind of utility in the, in the, released, uh, the released statistics. So the idea is to release something different, but close enough to the, to the statistic of interest, but in a way which will prevent re-identification of the individuals. And the contribution I have today is when the release data is, is a function rather than a vector. So uh, to emphasize, this is not some, although, okay, you may be left out of this talk with the impression that it was a very theoretical exercise. Uh, I want to emphasize now that it's not a fake and a made up problem. It, it's actually a real problem. Because uh, recently a lot of companies have found the hard way to uh, releasing something kind of innocuous seeming uh, leads to embarrassment down the road or, or lawsuits. So in 2006, AOL released a, a bunch of like, user search <coughs> logs from their search engine. As far as I'm aware, they didn't make any effort to, to sanitize this ahead of time. Uh, and in the end, you know, because people do things like search for themselves and their own home address and so forth, people were able to identify quite a lot of the individuals who uh, two searches went into that database, and it was very embarrassing for AOL. Uh, a couple of years ago, Netflix ran a competition where the idea was to, to build a really good recommender system. And part of the data release was a giant matrix where rows corresponded to individuals and uh, 
columns corresponding to movies, and the entries were like what rating the person gave a movie. Uh, although Netflix, in this case, made an effort to anonymize the data, right? They stripped out the names and stuff. They just gave people like, a unique identifier or something like this. Uh, well, a professor called Vitaly Shmatikov at uh, UT Austin was able to uh, combine the, the release data from Netflix with uh, a giant scrape of IMDb movie uh, reviews. It was able to use this to, to find uh, people to kind of match people between the Netflix data set and IMDb by, um, you know, if they focus on the exact same set of movies and give them the same rating, then they were likely to be the same person. So this led to like a lawsuit and Netflix very embarrassed and I guess canceled the, the Netflix prize. Uh, the next one. Here. So anyway, I'm just gonna jump right in and, and give some ideas of how a college kind of privacy can be protected better. So throughout this talk, I'm going to make use of algorithms which incorporate some kind of randomness into them. So we can imagine one algorithm that works like this. Okay, we have uh, hospitals that have private input data. I call it D, capital D, uh, consisting of X, Y, pairs, like in, for the case of progression. But in principle, it could be any database. Right? Uh, they compute whatever statistic it was that they originally wanted to release, so in this case, like ordinary displays, I mean, but they're not going to release that, it's, they're just going to hold on to that themselves. Uh, then what they'll do is uh, draw this other, this other value, they call it theta twiddle, from a distribution which depends on, uh, on theta hat. So in this case, it's the same as uh, adding normally distributed noise with some covariance matrix uh, to their original least squares estimated. And that's the thing that we'll get output. So in principle, uh, algorithms such as this uh, can basically just be characterized uh, by the probabilities they induce on the output space uh, when the input is some uh, database D. And so that's why I call this thing P sub D. And you can imagine a whole family of such uh, probability measures as D is allowed to range over the space of all possible input databases. So we uh, may ask, you know, what's the suitable criteria to, to judge whether or not such an algorithm <coughs> could be deemed to preserve privacy. And that's where the idea of differential privacy comes in. So this is uh, a, a definition which goes back to the early 2000s, seemed to gain a lot of popularity around 2006, and since then there's been a deluge of papers about this kind of thing, quite a lot of the machine learning conferences. But, so it, uh, differential privacy takes two parameters, they call them the alpha and beta, and say an algorithm is alpha, beta, differentially private whenever the, uh, the following holds, right? So the first thing I have is D twiddle D prime, which means a pair of databases who differ in one element, which means uh, D prime can be constructed by removing one row from database D and adding in a new row with different values. Right? And then for all uh, measurable sets on the output space, this is saying uh, the measure on some set A doesn't increase by much uh, if you were to run the algorithm on data set D prime instead of on D. And because this original relation, which is noted by twiddle, is symmetric, the same thing holds uh, when D and D prime are reversed in the, in the right-hand side. So overall, this means that as, uh, as, you, as the data set changes from D to D prime, uh, the measure on any uh, part of the output space isn't allowed to change very, very much. Uh, sometimes it's called approximate differential practice, which uh, I've introduced the parameters of beta. And traditionally, uh, differential privacy is taken as uh, when beta equals zero. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate on the case where beta is allowed to be greater than zero. Uh, I won't go too much into the implications of differential privacy, but if you're interested, I can recommend a good paper by Larry Wasserman, Chu Hang Zhu, and Jass called A Statistical Framework for Differential Privacy. It basically shows that if you have an algorithm which uh, achieves this definition, then it makes it extremely hard for an adversary with any kind of side information to do a hypothesis <coughs> test uh, whether a particular individual was in the original data set or not. So this is why it's a, uh, it's a good definition. Obviously, it becomes much stronger as, as alpha and beta <coughs> is small. We concentrate on a case when alpha and beta are very small. If they're, allowed to, if they're allowed to be very big, then it gives you a very loose, it's, it's a very loose requirement. 
So returning to our original, uh, our original proposed algorithm, where we, we may ask, uh, what kind of covariance matrix do we need in order to ensure that this thing achieves the differential fairness? Right? Uh, so here I've got a picture of two different data sets that are differing by one row. So I've written in red and row that differ. Uh, so this basically induces two different measures over the alpha space, right? P sub D and P sub D prime. So I've drawn uh, two normal distributions for you here. One of them is kind of opaque and the other one's translucent, just so you can see kind of how they overlap and get an idea. This is just uh, the normal densities, right? Uh, so it turns out that uh, they're close in the sense required for differential privacy whenever the following holds, which is saying that the two means are close in the Mahalanobis distance due to the covariance matrix, right? Uh, whenever the, the distance is bounded above by the term on the right. So, I mean, so for some alpha and beta, it gives the condition that's required on, on the sigma. So this term uh, is, tip, is like historically in the differential privacy literature referred to as the global sensitivity. It's, it's basically measuring how sensitive is the function you're trying to, to output. Like how much can it possibly change when the, the data is changed by one element? Uh, so some remarks. Uh, we can achieve the differential privacy, uh, but whatever arbitrary family effect is not just, in, in the example I was giving just the ordinary squares uh, estimate. But in principle, this works for any family effect is free to index by databases, uh, wherever the global sensitivity is appropriately bounded. Right? Uh, what's more, if it's bounded above by some constant but not the right thing on the right hand side, it's okay because we can just scale the covariance matrix and ensure that uh, the bound becomes the thing we want. Uh, typically, in order to have global sensitivity is bounded, requires data to, to lie in a compact set. Right? If data is allowed to take on any real value, then you can typically uh, make arbitrarily large sensitivity just by replacing a point which has like negative a billion value with a point that has a positive a billion or so forth. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I, I consider the case where wheat is greater than zero. If you want to achieve the differential privacy of wheat equal to zero, it requires Laplace noise instead of Gaussian noise. This is like slightly heavier tail distribution. Uh, and this is the one typically considered in the literature, but I, I won't go into it today because Gaussian is much more conceptually appealing to me. So that concludes the kind of introduction and how differential privacy has been achieved previously. Uh, I'm now going to move on to uh, what I've been thinking about lately, which is how the same thing can be applied when the opposite case <coughs> is a function rather than a vector. So, uh, so far there's been like a great deal of, of work when the output's a vector, right? People have uh, got this thing to work for all kinds of statistical estimates, like means, variances, etc. Logistic regression parameters, linear support vector machines, histograms, and, and so forth. Well, I'm going to consider methods where the output of the analysis is really a function. So things like kernel density estimators, uh, kernel support vector machines, and then uh, those are the two main examples I'll give, but we'll remark that this work could also be, in principle, applied to things like estimates, like means and whatnot, uh, when the data lie, when the data are actually in a function space, like uh, financial time series, etc. All right, so the difficulties when moving into a function space is that there are no densities in the, in the sense that everyone's probably familiar with, because there's no dominating measure on the set of functions. Uh, what's more, we, uh, since we leave the kind of familiar trappings of Euclidean space, we have to understand what's the sigma field in the space of functions as well. Like what objects can even get assigned probability. So I'm going to go briefly into a detour about how measures on function spaces are constructed and how uh, stochastic processes are constructed. So if you don't uh, know measure theory or if you uh, don't really, I don't know, if you don't really care about this stuff, it's fine, but hopefully these pictures will be uh, useful to help you think about this stuff. <coughs> so the main uh, object in moving from, from finite dimensional spaces to function spaces uh, is the 
the idea of a finite dimensional projection. Okay? So on the left here, I've got a picture of a function space, right? And I've drawn three particular functions in it. They're all continuous and so on. <coughs> That's just uh, due to the way that I drew them. Now we can, can, we can imagine a projection operator defined by evaluating those functions at a finite set of points. So here I've chosen two points labeled x1 and x2 on this axis. And we can imagine evaluating the functions of those two points, and for each function creating a vector right, in R2. Right? And I've shown uh, what those vectors will look like here <coughs> on the right hand side. So in principle, uh, the same thing can be done to, you know, by choosing more than two points. Right? You can choose any finite number of points, evaluate the functions. We've now got a mapping from a function space to a, a finite dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, the reason I use two here is because uh, you know, the limits of human brain power kind of preclude me from drawing more than three, and things get even a little bit hectic when there's three dimensions on the screen, so I, uh, I just love the two. Okay, so in order to define, uh, to define measures on a set of functions, we need uh, some preliminaries, specifically a sigma field, right? So it, if you don't know probability, a sigma field is just the set of things that get assigned probabilities, or in kind of <coughs> low, uh, maybe undergrad probability, it would be called an event space. Right? This is just like the things that could possibly have probabilities. Well, if we take the, the projection operation I just gave, uh, we, know, we already have a sigma field on the, on the finite dimensional Euclidean space. It's Borel's sigma field. Right? It's just the open balls, uh, intervals, so forth. Well, we can pull those, uh, those sets backwards through the mapping, right? So here I have a, a set on the two-dimensional Euclidean space. If we pull it back through the mapping, we just get uh, a set of functions that take on values uh, in that set, right, what, uh, under that projection operation. So really, it's just the, the functions that are constrained in some interval to those, in those two points. So I drew only a few functions on the left-hand side in principle that uh, it should be like a really thick band of, of every possible function that goes through those two, uh, those two little brackets. <coughs> so, so this defines a sigma field on, on the space of functions for any, for any finite choice of, uh, of, of the x's. But uh, this is kind of weird because it depended on this choice of x's, right? So the sigma field traditionally used on function spaces, you just take the union of, of all of those over every countable set of, uh, of points in the index space. And that's called the cylinder sigma field. Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter whether or not you, uh, I've lost you, but uh, if, uh, if so, then you know, we can talk about this at the end if you like. All right, the other important thing is how measures are defined in spaces of functions, right? Uh, it, uh, it, the way they're typically defined is by taking a set of uh, measures on the finite dimensional space, which is consistent in some, in some sense. Uh, and then if you have a, a measure on every finite dimensional projection, you pull it back through the map, uh, you get a measure on the function space, right? This is uh, exactly what uh, Kolmogorov's extension theorem tells you. If you're, if you're interested, I recommend to, uh, to read uh, Probability and Measure Theory by Billingsley. This book's very good. <coughs> anyway, so let me go into a concrete example of a, uh, of a measure on a space of functions. So one which you've possibly heard of because it's been used recently for Bayesian regression is called a Gaussian process, right? This is a collection of random variables indexed by some set t, uh, which you know you can take to be the real line of you know some Euclidean space. And in the previous example, I showed functions as though they were functions of a real line, uh, which is what t is, right? Okay, so for any finite subset of the index space, uh, these t's are basically taking the places of the x i's I had in the last slide. Uh, the distribution is multivariate norm. Okay, these are, these are like the finite dimensional projections I was telling you about uh, that, that construct the Gaussian process. So if you, if you take a, you know, you can think of a Gaussian process as a distribution of functions. You evaluate any finite set of points. What you've got is a vector which takes a, a multivariate normal distribution. Okay, the uh, Gaussian process is defined completely by two things. First is a mean function. And the second is a covariance kernel, which I put in quotes to be highly suggestive of what will come later. Uh, 
Yeah, and as I said, the, uh, these things can be interpreted as functions. So I have some examples here. So when the, the these are this is mean zero of Gaussian process on the uh, on the interval between zero and one, and uh, I have two different two different Gaussian processes kind of superimposed here, like two different draws from Gaussian process. Uh, taking using the covariance kernel, which is basically given by a Gaussian kernel. So you can see as the um, this h parameter, which is kind of in the place of the standard deviation of the, of the Gaussian kernel. As, it's, uh, as it gets smaller and smaller, the functions become much more kind of squigglier. And as it, as it increases, the functions are nice and smooth. <coughs> Another example with a different kernel. Now, uh, the, the only change that's happened is that in the exponent, the x minus y is no longer being squared. Right? This results in uh, much more jagged, non smooth looking functions. So, you know, the, the nature of the of the samples from Gaussian process are highly dependent on what this kernel looks like. Uh, what's more, we can have, we can take Gaussian process over higher dimensional input, uh, index spaces, right? So here's a Gaussian process defined over R2. I've drawn it as kind of a height field. And so, um, you know, in principle, these things exist in whatever dimension you, you, know, you think of. But these are the main ones which uh, I can plot for you. Anyway, so now all we have to do is define what it means to be differential, to achieve the differential privacy on a function space, and then we can get about actually achieving it. Okay? So we say the family of measures on a function space <coughs> will be differentially private whenever it's differentially private for every finite projection. Okay? Well, it turns out that this uh, implies that uh, the algorithm will be achieve the differential privacy on every countable projection too, but uh, this is kind of irrelevant because you can't output a count countable number of points. Anyway, so the obvious analog, it seems, of adding Gaussian noise to a vector is adding Gaussian process to a function, right? So I have here uh, the same hospitals before, database D, construct some function based on D, it's called F sub D here. And so, you know, it could be SVM or uh, kernel density estimate or whatever. And it's not going to release that function. So instead it will release uh, a draw from a Gaussian process whose mean is that function and with the covariance kernel K. And we may ask, just as we did before, when this will achieve the differential privacy. Well, uh, due to the Due to the construction I gave for the Gaussian process, uh, we we already know that all the finite dimensional distributions are multivariate normal distribution. So I know it's just a few minutes before I gave this. I've got a typo in here. So the t's should be x's. Uh, <coughs> it would have taken way longer to correct that than it did to put the small flag. In. <laughs> so uh, uh, remember from before we had the differential privacy every time the the difference in the means. Uh, the distance between the means was bounded in the in the Ma in the Mahalanobis distance, <coughs> where the matrix was the covariance matrix. Well, now we've, all I've done is is written down what the means and covariance matrix looks like for a finite dimensional projection, right? And so, uh, in the function space, we'll just achieve the differential privacy whenever <coughs> this thing's bounded for every finite dimensional projection, right? Now. A technique which allows us this uh, allows us to, to, to show a bound for this is if we suppose that all the functions lay in uh, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space corresponding to the kernel K, which was the covariance kernel used uh, used in the Gaussian process. <coughs> in this case, we find a valid upper bound for this term up above is given by <coughs> the distance in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which I will define for you shortly. Uh, and but this will hold for every finite dimensional projection. <coughs> So uh, I have a very distilled uh, kind of introduction to RKHSs for those who are unfamiliar. And RKHS is basically just the inner product space of functions. So we start with some functions h sub 0, which are just given by uh, finite linear combinations of these other functions kxi. kx uh, being defined inversely, just uh, fix one argument of the kernel <coughs> function and let the other one vary. And so each reproducing kernel of Hilbert space corresponds to a unique choice of kernel, uh, and vice versa. 
Uh, the inner product is defined like this. If we, if we take two functions, g and f, g defined with coordinates uh, psi and f with coordinates theta, then, uh, then the inner product is just given as a sum over, um, well, you can read what it says. I don't really know how to explain it. Anyway, the point is this definition leads to two very important properties which aren't you know, present in just an arbitrary uh, function, inner product space of a function. First one is the reproducing property, which is which tells you that uh, <coughs> if you take the, the inner product between two of these functions, kx, like I've given above, the result is just the kernel evaluated at those two points. All right, the second property, which is extremely important, is that the, the kx are just the representatives for the evaluation function. And what this means is, if you want to evaluate a function f at some point, that's the same as taking the inner product of that function well, with kx in the, in the RKHS. <coughs> so how do these two important properties help us? Well, all right, we're at the same type of again, so um, I'm very sorry for that. But um, what we can do, so this top quantity was the thing to be bounded, right? We can demonstrate that it's equal to the inner product in the RKHS between the difference of the two functions on the left and some projection p of the two of the two functions on the right, uh, where p is given uh, as above. So, unfortunately, I have to write it as this as this summation. Uh, I can't write it as uh, matrices, which would make everything like eminently clear, because it would require you know vectors where the elements of functions, and that would be kind of kind of ugly. But anyway, uh, this projection p is. Exactly it's exactly the same as an, ortho, uh, an orthogonal projection to a linear subspace, right? This is something that uh, should be quite familiar from linear algebra. <coughs> uh, you know, if, if this RKHS was Euclidean space, this would be very much easier to, to describe. But anyway, I've just drawn a little picture down here to remind you what a, an orthogonal projection onto a linear subspace looks like. I have some FD, apply the projection, or this dashed line is linear subspace. Evidently, uh, the inner product between these two vectors will be less than the inner product of FD uh, with itself, right? <coughs> because we just we've removed some uh, some elements. You know? Okay, so that gives this inequality, right? Uh, the inner product between, F, uh, between the difference in its projection is, is less than the inner, product, uh, the inner product of the difference with itself, which just gives the upper bound that was required. Yeah, sorry, uh, this projection looks so ugly, but... What is M? Oh, right, yeah, good, good question. M is just the matrix in the middle. I, I, I didn't want to write out uh, that whole matrix again inside this equation. But this just means the ij element of the inverse, ma the inverse covariance matrix. So hopefully, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, I don't have enough time to really dwell on this, but uh, you can see that um, this, this equality I've written up top, uh, just because by using the, uh, the the fact that the the rightmost thing in the projection is just the evaluation function, or the evaluation taking place in the in the rightmost vector above, and likewise taking the inner product, uh, the the kxi on the left is basically what's going to evaluate that the difference function for the vector on the, on the left. Anyway, so going back to our original question of when adding uh, Gaussian process noise achieves a differential privacy, we can say at least uh, whenever the, the difference in the, sorry, whenever the distance in the reproducing kernel over space is bounded above by the appropriate term. I say at least because this is a sufficient condition, right? I haven't shown a necessary condition or anything like that. And likewise, you know, whenever this uh, difference is bounded, uh, then the correct term can be got on the uh, on the right side just by scaling the covariance kernel. So I go to some examples now. Uh, so the first is a, a kernel density estimation. This is a pretty useful uh, way to estimate a density in statistics. You know, taken by just uh, you have a bunch of data points, say so groups crosses, you put the Gaussian kernel over one, sum them up and average it, and you get a pretty good estimator of, uh, of the underlying density, right? 
So you can ask, how can we release these in a way that protects the privacy? Well, on two adjacent data sets, we can compute what the, what the difference between two functions is. Everything cancels except, except the, uh, the kernels of the two points which differ. So we get a function which looks like this, just the difference between two Gaussian kernels of different means. Uh, now, these functions are uh, uh, in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, where the kernel is, uh, you know, the same kernel used in the in the definition of the functions. Right? This should be pretty pretty clear, uh, just because uh, the difference can be written as uh, uh, if we take the two data sets D and D prime to differ in that one contains element X n and one contains element X n prime. Uh, then the difference is written uh, like this. Okay, so uh, the upper bound on the RKHS distance is, is obtained quite trivially now because uh, once we look at the form for the, remember the form for the norm is just the inner product, the, the square norm is just the inner product, and taking the inner product and using the reproducing, uh, the reproducing property or whatnot, we get this um, pretty straightforward, uh, straightforward thing which can be bounded. And then, uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, it's not bounded above by something which depends on alpha and beta in a way which we like. So we have to scale it appropriately. So rather than you know scaling the kernel, I just uh, I re rewrote these things, adding a zero mean Gaussian process, it, which is itself being appropriately scaled. This is the same thing. So we find that uh, that this method will achieve the differential privacy. What's more. If we look at the terms down here that depend on n and h, uh, h being the bandwidth to the, to the kernel density estimate, n being the number of points, we find that the order of the error is on the same order as the as the sampling error already was, right? So by adding this private, uh, by main, you know, in maintaining the privacy, we do not hurt the asymptotics of the, of the kernel density estimation. So here's an example. In the black line, I have a kernel density estimator on like 100 points, I just generated them from a mixture of two normals. And then in the blue line, I have an example of a, a differentially private kernel density estimator, where I use alpha is 1, beta is 0.1, something like this. And we know that you know, this function remains smooth, so errors on the same order, it seems like everything's pretty good. All right, another example of how this can be applied is to a kernel support vector machine. So consider doing regularized uh, empirical risk minimization in the RKHS. Or, uh, yeah. the, uh, this is what I've written at the top. You, uh, it may seem quite familiar to whoever's taken uh, 701, the machine learning class, because it looks fairly similar to, uh, to the form of, like, uh, I guess, the primal form of the SVM. Anyway. If we consider taking the, the function g, which minimizes some loss term plus some regularization term when the regularization is uh, measured in RKHS norm, right? This corresponds to a, you know, in the case of classification where the losses, the hinge losses, corresponds to a, a kernel support vector machine, where the kernel is the one corresponding to the RKHS, right? Well, two guys in JMLR 2002, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce their names. Uh, they gave it a nice technique to bound the RKHS distance between between these kind of uh, functions uh, on adjacent data sets. Okay, it's kind of uh, a coincidence they were looking at this. They they didn't care about privacy at all. What they were trying to do was to use McDermott's inequality uh, to get generalization error bounds on the on the uh, on the class. <coughs> uh, if you're familiar with McDermott's inequality, the uh, the, car, the kind of correspondence between the notion of global sensitivity, which I set up, and the, uh, one of, and the kind of requirement of McDermott's inequality of the difference of functions on neighboring data sets being found. Uh, hopefully, I'll be quite clear. If you don't know McDermott's inequality, you should look it up because uh, it's probably really useful. Anyway, uh, this was used in differential privacy once before by, by my friend Ben Rubenstein, but not for the Really, you know, releasing functions or anything. He was just using it to get a handle on the sensitivity of, of his SVM, which was a, uh, a, a linear SVM. Anyway, 
Following through the mess, we get the we get the bound that we <laughs> that we needed. The, uh, the difference is bounded above by uh, a term which is like one over lambda n, right? Or m over lambda n. M is being Lipschitz constant to whatever the loss function in the risk minimization. And this thing is just a constant usually, right? Depending on what the kernel is, it's probably one or something like that. <coughs> anyway, uh, so so. The important thing here is usually when you do an SPM, you want to let lambda go to zero, right? Uh, which seems bad because it means that this, uh, you know, maybe this up bound is going to blow up. But if you let lambda go to zero suitably slowly, like one over the square root of n, something like that, then evidently this uh, this up bound will still be going to zero. The SPM will still be um, consistent, and so uh, using the using the Gaussian process noise addition won't screw the asymptotics up there either. So I have an example here that I, I did. So it's the two-class SVM. Up top is the non-private version. So what's shown are red and blue points corresponding to two classes. Then the background color is the is the prediction obtained by uh, the SVM that I trained. Right? So where the background's red, it predicts you know, the red class and so forth. Now on the bottom, I have uh, the same SVM, but where a two-dimensional Gaussian process has been added to the regression function. So now it's, you know, uh, well, first of all, it obviously looks a lot different. There's patches of blue all over the place. Uh, some remarks. When the density of points is quite high, uh, it seems like the, the classification isn't getting upset too much by the, by the addition of the noise, right? Whereas where the points are getting more sparse and spread out, where the, you know, where the regression functions of the kernel SPM is, is going to have small values anyway, then the, uh, the classification gets more upset by the noise addition. But it seems, although I haven't gone through the, the theory of this, it, it seems likely that um, the, the addition of privacy won't upset the classification accuracy too much when it's assumed that the points are being drawn from the same distribution as the, as the training data. Because it's very unlikely that um, points from out from far away where the classification is messed up will, will be sampled. All right. So the above, uh, those two examples I gave were kind of ad hoc. The first one uh, yielded to a very straightforward ad hoc analysis uh, to get a to get a bound on the on the RKHS distance. And the second one used some pretty complicated technique that I found in someone else's JML application. Right. So maybe this is uh, maybe this is kind of unappealing. Well, it turns out we can use the same, you know, we can use the same tech, the same like overall method of adding a Gaussian process to, to a much more general class of functions, right? And these are functions of a Sobolev space. So a Sobolev space is just a set of uh, continuous functions whose uh, derivative is bounded in the L2 norm, right? I, I call it H1 here on the set of, this is just the, the restriction uh, to the functions <coughs> interval between zero and one. So if you look in the textbook on RKHS, this the set is itself an RKHS where the kernel and the corresponding norm are given, are given like so. So therefore, uh, it's possible to achieve <coughs> differential privacy to any family of functions where the uh, where the, the norm is bounded above by some term that you can get a handle on, right? So basically anything where you can integrate its derivative, you can <coughs> apply this technique. And on, although I've shown here only, only for one dimension, the same thing will work out in high dimensions too. So uh, to, to demonstrate that this works, uh, we redid the analysis for kernel density estimation using that technique. And we get a different, yeah. different we're using a different degrees of kernel Hilbert space, so we have a different distance. And we, we find that it's bounded above by uh, this term. And what we see is it's basically on the same order as the one was before. And right? if we take square roots on either side, it's 1 over n times h, which is the same order as the, as the original technique when, we, when it was in one dimension. So even though we've used a, like a way more general, kind of less ad hoc analysis, we get errors on the same order and the constants uh, within a factor of 2. So it's not too bad. Uh, when, when applying this technique, uh, 
the unfortunately the sample parts of the Gaussian process corresponding to this kernel are more jagged, so you lose the conceptually kind of appealing smoothness and require some pro some kind of post processing to smooth it out. Uh, but nevertheless, the error is still in the correct order, so as n goes to infinity, you know, h uh, goes to zero appropriately slowly, then the, uh, this released private estimator will still um, converge to the underlying density. All right, so this kind of concludes uh, what I had to say. Just some more remarks. The main things that have been missing from this exposition is to get lower error bounds, right? To determine uh, if we want to achieve the alpha beta differential privacy, how much error must we put up with? All I've shown so far is a couple of techniques which achieve it, and I haven't really had to say it. I haven't really had much to say about the error other than it's not going to mess up the asymptotic stream. Likewise, uh, to get at the upper error bounds, um, so. I was talking about error, I, did, I actually didn't say it during the talk, but I was talking about error in the L2 metric, right? In principle, other metrics are equally interesting, such as L infinity metric, and uh, in the case of SVM, the classification error. And so in order to get a handle on, on how bad these are, but that's kind of, the, should be the focus of some future work, I think. And also to extend the Sokolov technique, as I, as I demonstrated, into higher dimensions, so it could be useful for the support back to the machine and so forth. Okay. Thanks very much.